Hey everybody, Jessica Henry Gray here, and I'm excited to be back here on Facebook Live. I know it's been a long time, and I'm just gonna wait a little bit till some people get on before I jump into what I wanna talk about today. So um, I'm excited to be here, and I'm excited to just um, be starting these back up again. I think that they're a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, so we'll, we will be doing this a little bit more often. Um, and I'm also gonna be putting these on YouTube as well. So I think that that's going to be a lot of fun too. Um, so we'll just wait a little bit for others to join us. And um, all right, so I know that you can see I'm in my studio here and I've got um, just some things behind me I'll talk about here soon. And uh, yeah, so anyway, um, I'm excited to be doing this. And um, let's see, I hope that this is okay. Do I have, okay. <laughs> All right, uh, so anyway, um, I just wanted to, before I jump into setting, how to set up a still life, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about um, what we are offering now on our website. So I have, I'm, I'm gonna talk about it a little bit more as we go along today, but I wanna talk about um, the video lessons that we are going to be offering. Actually, they're already on our website, my website, Jessica Henry Fine Art, and, um, it's they're pretty cool. They're um, the video workshop lessons that I've been doing the online um, lessons. And so we pre record those separately. And so now I'm offering those video lessons uh, to everybody. And um, they're at a reduced price than just taking it online. And um, hi, everybody. And so yeah, so those um, and I'll, I'll keep going on about some of the things that I've been talking about already. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. Good to see you. And I'm just kind of filling the air till people come on. And uh, yeah, so how are you, Lily? Good to see you. <laughs> Hi, Daniel. Good morning. It is, well, it's kind of just, just turned afternoon. <laughs> Probably where you guys are further out west. Um, yeah, uh, it's, I hope that you're getting ready for Christmas and have a good season ahead of you. And I suppose that you're warmer. Um, oh, Lily, I wanted to thank you for your Christmas card. That's very sweet of you. We got it. And um, so I will, I'm, I'm excited. I haven't sent mine out yet <laughs> this year. Uh, yeah. So anyway, um, I'm going to just kind of jump in and get going talking about the things that I wanted to talk about today. So thank you everyone for joining me. And I'm really happy to have you here. And I'm excited to be back on the Facebook um, doing these videos. And I'm going to try to keep them short because... You know who has time to sit and watch an hour and a half long video so um that's hard for me to do though to keep them short especially as i'm gathering stuff and i'm thinking about things i want to um talk about and i think oh I, okay there's a lot of things i want to share but i'm gonna just work really hard to space out those um lessons in over the next uh, i don't know months weeks whatever so, um, and I was talking about before everybody got on, um, that uh, we are now on my uh, website, Jessica Henry Fine Art, are offering the workshop lessons that I had done, the online lessons that we pre-recorded separately. And so those, I have um, plenar painting, that is a five part video lesson. The really cool thing about these video lessons is, that we are offering is that they now offer uh, private coaching. So. That's a really special and unique uh, thing that we're uh, offering. And so you get the, the video lessons and they're each, um, you know, a couple hours long for each lesson. And then um, for the included in the price is a 25 minute coaching session. So that is really, um, that's a really special um, offering that we've never done before we, with the added um, feature of Zoom. Uh, there'll be private classes and a private uh, lessons for that. So uh, anyway, good to see you guys. So yeah, we've got um, five videos of plein air painting. I have um, three videos available as a package set um, of painting the pet portrait. And then I have four of just painting the regular portrait. Uh, and they're all, they range in price between $150 and $200 for all the videos plus the private coaching, the 25 minute private coaching. And then if you don't wanna do the video lessons, I'm also just offering private coaching as well. So uh, those are sold in um, increments of 25 minutes. So good to see everybody. So check that out, Jessica Henry Fine Art, and um, they're under workshops. So hi, Ida, 
Good to see you. Um, so I'm going to take these videos also here from Facebook and put them on YouTube. So that being said, um, when I get into the lesson, I will try to read your comments and questions, but I'll try really hard to only respond to the questions um, that pertain to what we're doing. Otherwise, I may have to get at them at the end because um, I've been told in some of my older videos, stop talking to everybody. <laughs> So anyway, so that's fine and I will do that um, as much as I can. All right, so let's jump into the lesson. I've, I'm excited to share these with you today and I, I'm going to really strive to keep it short, but I'm going to do a little painting demo too. So as I was gathering things, that was right on my mind. I mean, I'm, I'm struggling with, I want to paint a beautiful picture, but I also want to keep it a shorter lesson. So anyway, I promised today that I would talk about how to set up in your home um, a still life situation. And um, I'm gonna talk about painting that quickly. So I've got lighting and here, I'm just gonna back the camera up a little bit and I'll show you what I have going on. You can kind of see, I have just taken, this is a super simple setup. So this is just a table. And if you don't have a table that is the right height for you, stack it up with boxes or books or whatever. And um, hi, Elizabeth. So stack it up with books and whatever. Um, I have a large piece of masonite under here just as a support. And then I folded some cardboard and just sort of taped it here um, just to give me some sort of blocking of light. I have um, track light in here in my studio that I turned off. I've got a window on this side over here that um, I've shut because I, I don't want that conflicting light. A lot of people like to paint with north light um, light and that's ideal but I don't have that in my studio. And so that's what I wanted to talk about is sometimes you just have to deal with what you have and not everybody can in their homes take the North Light window because for whatever reason, it's not a, I don't know, whatever. Anyway, so that's South facing light. And so I cover that up. South is not as great as North because it, it's not as consistent through the day. North Light is more consistent and um, East and West isn't good either. So if that's what you have to deal with, then just block them off and then you can control your lighting, especially with still lifes. You want to control it anyway. So what I have here is, this is my light. This is, I have these little, um, they're like a, I don't know what they're called, little directing, they've got these little flaps. And I like these because they can kind of, I can laser direct my light onto my still life or I can open it up and kind of flood the still life with more light if I want to do that. Uh, these, uh, I got on Amazon. You would just have to Google, um, the, it's photography lights and they, they came with flash bulbs and I took those out and put a daylight light bulb in. You, that's very important that you get daylight, natural light because incandescent bulbs or like a white light, um, incandescence almost gold and that doesn't work. And then, um, the white light is too cool and it really just makes everything cool however outdoor light the um and then the natural light is a really good bulb for um, getting color accuracy okay so if you have to deal with that that is a great um light if you can't find these on amazon or you can and they're ridiculously expensive um over here is one of those just a desk lamp you can use that um, if you go to the hardware store, you can get uh, those little metal lamps um, and they're like heat lamps, but you just put the regular, you know, the appropriate light bulb in. And um, Elizabeth, to address your uh, comment about the flaps, if you take tin foil, a couple of chunks of tin foil and scrunch it around the edge of the, um, the light that you're using, then you can mold and shape your tin foil to funnel the light like I do here. So if I close up my flaps, it's like a laser light onto my still life or, you know, same thing with your tin foil. You can open that up really wide and flood it. So that was what I used for years before I got these, just tin foil on my light. Um, so there's that. So I hope that that helps with any answers people or questions people might have about light. So just use whatever you have, block out as much as you can. For the sake of filming, it's always kind of a challenge uh, because you'll see I have a little bit more lighting than what I probably would if I was by myself in the studio. I probably have a little darker. Um, the point is you have to be able to see your canvas and it's amazing how we can have a tendency to kind of, well, it's, it's light enough and it's pretty dark and then before you realize it, you take the painting out into natural light and it just looks weird because you painted it in the dark. So 
Make sure that you have enough light on your canvas. Um, like I said, I have a little bit more than what I would normally like, just simply for the sake of filming so that you can see what I'm doing. Okay, so that is that. So when you are preparing for your still lifes, um, you wanna gather a bunch of stuff and start collecting fabrics and go on treasure hunts and find things that interest you. Um, but yeah, I, I, before I launch into that, I wanna talk a little bit about still lifes in general. Uh, normally I'm teaching plein air or something like that, but when we get into the colder months, I like to go indoors and really focus on still lifes and portraits and then even working from photos. So I'm gonna share those with you as we move along in these video lessons because they are all essential. Everything ties together, whether you're working on a portrait from life or from photo, whether you only wanna do landscape, I suggest always um, learning to uh, work from photos because it challenges you um, and you have to deal with you know, color, the um, distortions and the value distortions. Learning to work from still lifes from life teaches you how to really observe and get in and notice those reflected lights and soft transitional edges and painting atmosphere and land, uh, like the, the movement of light in your still life. What does that sound like? It sounds like a landscape. Well, all of the elements of painting a still life are consistent with painting landscapes or portraits because you're dealing with the same ideas of dealing with near far cool warm balances hard edge soft edge contrast and all of those important matters that it, once you get those under your belt i'm not saying they have to be mastered but you have to at least understand that they're essential and then as as you get more fluent in the process of painting you pick up the reins of all those horses and you start driving them with a little bit more consistency and regularity okay so that's my preaching about the importance of still lives. So getting back into this. So as you um, begin the idea of setting things up, I wanna encourage you to go very simple. And there's nothing wrong with keeping your still life simple and keep it you know, calm, quiet, doesn't, all of that. I think that people get hung up by the idea that your still life has to have a theme, you know, um, like grandpa's memories or you know, Aunt, Aunt Susie's, um, whatever it doesn't um it really doesn't those are fun and you know i've got like teacups and i'm thinking tea bags and, and little flowers none of that is really essential those ideas of telling a narrative still life are cool but let's put those aside because when you're developing your knowledge of still life painting you have to learn about light movement color contrast edges atmosphere um and those critical things before you can start to try to tell a story and then when you get those mastered then it's okay to start playing with um you know old photos and memories and uh, you know the antique cameras and things the things that tell a story in your still life not essential first get the basics and then then you can branch off to those okay so what I've done is I've gone on just sort of a scavenger hunt. It's a little bit of a challenge because like I said earlier, I really want to paint an elaborate, beautiful still life, but we're um, kind of cuffed by the constraints of time because I want to keep the videos shorter. And this one may be a little bit longer because we're talking about everything else. Um, so I have just a really nice um, kind of neutral piece of fabric. I love to start my still lifes with a piece of fabric. Um, of course, I have the confines here. If you're just joining, this is just cardboard taped like this and I tacked a piece of fabric to the back of the wall. You can line the inside of this box with fabric too if you want. Um, I, I don't, it, you can, but for me the purpose of having this cardboard here is just to block out ambient light and that's all. Um, so I grabbed some stuff that I thought would make an interesting still life. This is all way, way, way more than I need, but that's what you should do. When you're setting up a still life, just grab a bunch of things. A lot of things that you think might make an interesting arrangement. Don't worry about if they connect. I don't care if you have a piece of garlic with a fishing tackle, whatever, who cares? The idea is to make something that is going to convey a concept. So by what I mean by a concept is what is it you really want to talk about? Um, movement of light. Um, you want to talk about contrast of textures. Do you want to talk about mood? Um, keep it all dark and broody with just a few highlights. Have only one concept. Have one idea per painting. And everything else is secondary to that one idea. Okay, so that's why it doesn't matter if it's 
um, you know, a, a fishing lure and a loaf of bread. Your ideas are what's going to create that, that beauty because beauty is forever. A story is temporal. All right. So I have this knife in case I want to cut something. And I, I grabbed all these teacups because I just thought they were so pretty. And um, teacups are gorgeous in a still life. And I'm not going to paint any of these today. Uh, it would take too long to, you know, I mean, you were always fighting the ellipticals and, and things like that. But I will be painting them as we go along in these videos. But anyway, so I'm taking these out. And I'll just set them aside. But I just thought it was kind of fun to have them in there and talk about it a little bit. All right, so I've got this really cool hammered uh, brass pot. And I think I may uh, throw that in. I don't think it would take too long to paint. And be sure that when you are setting up, <laughs> I've done this more times than I care to admit. I've set the still life up from a front shot, like right here. <laughs> and then I come over here to paint and it's all different. So be aware of that when you're setting it up. Just that, you're, that whatever perspective you're arranging it is the pr perspective from which you're going to be seeing it. <laughs> Seems very basic, but you never know. Um, sometimes, especially as you're driving a lot of horses, you can get distracted with this or that, and before you know it, you're off track. Um, so I have this beautiful little sterling silver, uh, little cup. I use this in my kitchen, actually, to put all my testing spoons by my stove. Um, so there's that. I, I have this orange. I thought I'd slice that open. I've got some garlic, some shallots, and these really pretty grapes, and a white cloth, um, and I may play with these, but I'm not probably not going to paint them all. So what I want to do is I'm going to move my palette um, just over here, out of the way. Got my jungle of plants in the studio, staying warm from being outside. It's kind of nice. Okay, so um, I like these towels. I kind of like the texture of this towel a little better than this fabric. So I'm going to move these grapes and get rid of that piece of fabric. So now I'm standing here because this is where I'm gonna, my perspective is gonna be this way. So that's another thing as you're watching me paint, um, I'm gonna be this way and you're probably gonna see it more straight on so it's not gonna be 100% accurate. And I will be bringing you a lot closer um, when I do the painting and you'll be able to see my palette. But um, so anyway, I'm thinking about now as I set this up, uh, and I always wanna turn my light on while I'm setting it up. This light is not where I'm gonna leave it, but it gives me an idea of what the objects will look like under that light. And uh, so I'm thinking about, as I have my canvas here, how I want this to look and how I want the objects to play throughout the canvas. And I'm gonna just close that a little bit. If you have tin foil on your light, you can close it up a little and it changes everything. Um, I'm trying to think, do I want the fabric on here? I'm gonna leave the fabric off only because I think it's gonna take a little bit longer to add in the still life today. And again, I'm trying to keep it short. So I've got my copper pot here and I love grapes. I'm gonna put some grapes in here. But my first question is, is what is gonna be kind of my focal area? What do I really wanna focus on in this painting today? And so that's the first deciding factor. I, I developed my concept. Today I wanna to paint a painting about light. I'm just feeling I need to get that broody light if that's your concept. Um, have that as your deciding factor for everything. So in this case, if I wanted to do that about light, I may want to make this really dramatic. And the closer I bring it, the more dramatic my lighting gets. The further back I push my light, the softer the lighting gets and the less dramatic it gets. So um, that's something to keep in mind. Um, let's see. Now I like the silver and the gold together, the brass, but it might be a little bit um, competing for attention because uh, you want to always be aware of where your eye is looking. If it's if something else is screaming for it to look at it, then you need to temper back something else. You can't have everything of equal importance. Um, I have this board. This is actually a cutting board. I just love this thing. And I may put this in. I'm just going to flip it over and not use this really cool side because, again, it's a timing thing. So if I just flip it like that... And I put, um, yeah, I think I'll use the brass today. So what if, oh, if you can just paint on the wall of your studio, the words, what if, 
I always ask myself, what if I tried this? What if I did that? What if I pushed this? What, you know, I always, what if, because that is, that's um, gonna encourage your creative mind to really branch out. Okay, so what if? I'm looking at it from this way and I pull this in. Um, creating a still life and setting it up is very um, intuitive. And, and I, it, the, the thing you don't wanna do is talk because when you're speaking, you are being cerebral and left-brained, left-brained this side. Um, Facebook Live, by the way, uh, reverses the image, just so you know. Um, so anyway, speaking is left brain and setting up a still life is very right-brained. It's very intuitive and you're being creative and you're thinking about um, how things relate to each other. So I'm going to uh, get in that other side of my brain and focus on setting this up. And then I will explain a little bit as I'm kind of going or wrapping it up what I was thinking. <laughs> God only knows. Okay, so let me get going. Peeling a chunk of the orange off. I think that that rind is really, or the membrane, it's kind of interesting. we're getting somewhere um, I'm thinking too if I have this leading it in and then cascading off it makes it kind of interesting I don't want it to look super staged I think that it can tend to look um, formulaic but I do want to make it you know an interesting decorative it's kind of a very warm painting See, I'm already thinking about it as a painting. It's still like <laughs> very warm tones. Maybe I want a contrast of something cool, blue. Uh, I think. I mean, the grapes could kind of be that, but. I'm also thinking about this like music, like it builds on this side. Remember, I'm looking at I'm looking at it from this way. Music builds, and then it reaches the climax, and then it kind of fades off. And so I'm thinking about this last little orange peel in the shadow way back there. I don't know that you can see it. This little guy back here, and and how it has sort of that sense of it being like a music, and um, <laughs> and uh, so I'm thinking about that. Um, Daniel, I'll get to your comment here in a minute. Um, let me think about moving this. I don't want this to be in your way, but what if, what if I lower this? See, you can almost bring the light down to like, like level with it and then shoot the spotlight up and everything changes. It can look totally different 
by doing a few adjustments that way. Um, I think even at this point it's going to be a long still life and I want to try to get it a little bit faster than what I've got here. Um, and those grapes over. Ooh. I think we're getting the the neighbor across the street that they've got a truck that sucks up all the leaves. Oh, I saw it was noisy. Okay. Now here's where if I add uh, hmm I don't really have anything else like handy that's cool. No. All right. So I think that I'm going to go with that, but I think I'm going to paint, make sure that I paint the dust on the grapes a little cooler. Sometimes they're kind of hard to see. Excuse me while I get all this stuff somewhere. Okay. I'll move this. I'll be right back. Just setting it down. I'm still here. All right. So um, now, uh, Daniel, your comment was that the, the bigness of the pot or the, the huge container is throwing you off. Okay. What I want to say about that is when you're painting on your canvas, you make those adjustments on canvas to suit your own taste. I'm not saying to reinvent the wheel. Um, by all means, what you set up, you want to capture on here. But with a still life, I, I, have, I think in every still life, I adjust sizes a little bit to make the canvas really sing for me rather than being married to reality. Uh, I do the same thing with plein air painting. Uh, you can get too literal with nature, even your still life. So uh, you can't with portraiture, I'm afraid. You have to be dead on with portraits. But with still life and landscape, I, I kind of allow for those uh, variables to change a little as I work on things. So I hope that that helped uh, Daniel with that. And you can also um, set your canvas more vertical too if you want. All right, so I am set up here and I've toned my canvas. I've got um, ultramarine blue, burnt sienna, and a little bit of yellow ochre into this. I did it a few hours ago. I could rub it if I wanted to and get some on my finger, but it's kind of dry to the touch. Not perfectly, but all right. So now I'm gonna bring you in a little bit closer and get myself set up. Oh, this is so fun. I missed everybody. <laughs> Uh, I missed Facebook Live. I was actually, I was actually nervous to come on today. I don't know why. <laughs> Everything can go wrong. And you know, that's how it is with um, live videos. Things can always just go wonky and you never know. Okay, so I think if I put the camera right here, you can sort of see what I'm doing. Again, the angle's going to be a little bit off. And um, if I sit here... <laughs> my palette. I already have my paints out. Oh, you're not going to be able to see my palette. All right, so I'm moving you back a little and then I'll go like this. That's good. All right, so I think that's going to work. I've got my cup here with the oil. Got my coffee here, so hold on. All right, now, um, for colors today, I'm going to use, oops, I'm not going to spill that all over me. The funny thing about live videos versus, um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, versus the YouTube videos is I can uh, edit out all of my mishaps and spills on YouTube, but <laughs> on these, like you guys get to see them all. All right, so titanium white. I do have some other colors on my palette from other paintings I'm working on right now. So I'll just skip over those. Um, I have cadmium yellow light, cadmium yellow medium. I'll probably use both of them today. Cad red light. Um, this is yellow ochre, burnt sienna, ultramarine blue, alizarin permanent, and some phthalo green. These are just colors from, again, my other project. Okay. So... Turning to face, okay, like that. Now I, I won't be able to see your comments while I'm working, but I will try to get to you afterwards if you have any questions. 
And um, I will check back as often as I can to the screen. <laughs> I'm just gonna set my linseed oil off to the side right here because clipping it to my palette, and I, have, I hold my palette like this, um, it tends to drip down. Bounty paper towel. Now when I'm laying out my um, design on the canvas, I, um, I wanna just sort of relax and think about uh, my first rule of composition, which is this rectangle. And, um, you know, so I'm looking at it, thinking about visualizing what this canvas is gonna look like when it's done. And that's very, very important. If you don't have a focus, if you don't have an idea, you're gonna be just sort of scrambling around. And so having that in your mind is the first step. So getting my head in the game. It's all left-brained speaking, and now I'm getting into this. So I'm just using a, this is a rosemary brush size four. Uh, it's a flat. I love their long flats. It says ultimate long flat, but I, I know that they have even longer ones. But this is not one of those. All right, so I just have a thinned mixture here, and I used a little bit of linseed oil uh, for this. My first thing I'm thinking about is where the top is going to be and where the bottom is. That's going to give me a sense of scale. I know right now that this is going to be, you know, kind of within this confines in here. And I may want to make it a little bit smaller. I like to have my um, a sense of air around my objects. If you make them too big, they feel crowded. And I see that happen all the time with students. They tend to make their objects really large. Um, just watch out for that tendency to do that um, because uh, they'll feel crowded. And um, so now I'm also thinking about, because this is my first focus of beauty, even more than that, I'm making those size adjustments that are gonna be pleasing on here. So the grapes, thinking about the grapes as a mass, not as individuals, it will give them more of a sense of a, a nice um, clumpy mass. <laughs> the stem's gonna go off that way. And I like how that gives it a little bit of that contrast. So we're talking about contrast, the stem going this way while everything else is going this way. So my, con my concept in this painting is to create this sense of movement. I really like how the grapes are sort of like music, just leading us in. There's, I don't think you can see them very, yeah, you can, they're a little bit different for me um, in my perspective here. So I've got one here one here and then they just kind of cascade up the mass of grapes and I'm going to use a little bit of alizarin I don't know if you can see it on my palette I'm just using some alizarin uh, as I mass in these grapes and I do that in case some of it shows through which it will because I I like to paint things um, a little more transparent I'm just thinking, okay, so if that's there. There's that. Always keep keep it all loose. Keep everything subtle. Um, it's a lot easier to wipe off your paint with like in this stage, if you're just using the paint to figure out where you're going. If you're gonna use pencil and draw it on, then what happens is, is you end up filling in the lines and it becomes kind of stiff and it doesn't have a sense of, of life and energy. It just, it more or less feels like, um, kind of like a paint by number, you know? If, if it's just linear and it's a matter of painting one thing and then the next. So I'm massing out some of these darker anchor 
shadow places. And it's got this beautiful transparent, I don't know if you can see that on there a little bit, um, that orange wedge, the light's shining through it. That's one of my favorite things to paint. And this grape is casting a shadow as is this one pointing us back this way. And the shadow of this orange and these grapes. And then this little wedge of an orange. And again, I'm not trying to draw everything on. I'm thinking about sculpting and massing in um, the objects. That's more important than anything else at this point. I'm holding my brush way back so that I, I don't want to get in here and do this. Don't, don't start doing this because um, then you can, again, get really precious with it and you don't want to do that at this point. There's a time and place for getting in there and, and putting a little bit of love and attention on it, but it's not right at the beginning. And I purposely didn't dust this pot. I think it looks really neat when there's a layer of dust on them. It just has an interesting, sort of a quiet feeling. And when you're painting something that's very symmetrical, um, try to keep yourself as straight as you can, perpendicular to the canvas. Looking at the, the, the shadow on this uh, brass pot is darker than the background on this side. So be sensitive to those things too. What, watch your shadows and what's happening with your background because uh, backgrounds do more even to help you do your painting and really make the magic happen um, by painting uh, the backgrounds to be supportive of what's happening in the front. So watch, watch for that. I'm letting some of this just fade into obscurity there, a little bit of dark. And then behind this orange, always looking for places where edges can get lost too. So back here, a little bit more linseed oil. So that's where my last little orange is. The peel is going to be way back there. And uh, we'll let all of that just slip back there into shadow. And this is just a little lighter behind the pot on this side. Here, let me use a little more linseed oil. So I'm gonna use that to help define the form of that pot. Soft edge will convey a feeling of continuity and roundness. So if you put a sharp edge on something, even though I can look over there and see a sharp edge, if you paint it that way, it will appear flat and cut out. So you don't want to do that. Make sure that rounded objects have that um, a softer edge. And I pretty much have all rounded edges in here except for the transparent orange wedge in the foreground. So 
and this edge here is completely lost to the background. If you're struggling with finding out what edges are lost and which ones aren't, um, squint and, and try to look at the whole thing. Just squint down and see what you don't see. If you can concentrate on just looking at your center of interest when you're squinting, in this case, it would be the this, this passage right in here where the shine is on the copper or the brass and the orange. Just focus on that as you're squinting and then peripherally look at everything else. It will, um, you'll, you'll see it in a little bit more of the balance. You'll see your soft edges. Just gonna take the smallest bit of white into that yellow ochre and some of that background color. Just to put right here. Oops. Don't want to overdo it on the white though. That can it can cool it down and make it chalky. And I don't want that to happen. But again, um, I do want the background to feel more cool because I've got an overwhelming warmth right here. <laughs> um, and so I'm going to try to just keep this cooler. Cool will recede too, just like in painting landscapes or anything else. Remember, if it works for one discipline, it's going to work for all of them because the concepts of painting are consistent in whatever discipline you're doing. Okay, so I like that um, passage right there where I painted that a little bit lighter. Okay, now on this side of the pot and the grapes, I'm going to use a little bit of the darker now and uh, I'll sculpt out the grapes and the pot with a darker paint. And be careful not to use too much linseed oil. People ask often, well, how much do you know to use? I just dip the corner of my brush in and I mix it with the paint I'm working with until it has a softer quality and, and something I'm looking for that way. So I'm going to just paint around that stem. And then the grapes I've got. And I don't, I'm not worried so much now about the alizarin crimson. I'm just painting around the, the pile of grapes here. Squinting down at it. If you have something complex, whether it's grapes or an entire forest, squint and it will simplify the mass and it will make it, it kind of breaks it down so that you can say, oh, you know, the, okay, you know, if I just start with sort of that background there and, um, and then kind of build up the layers that way, it, it'll make more sense. Now I'm establishing this value all the way over to the edge. That way I can get a sense of placement on my canvas too. And be, be prepared at any point if you need to, to wipe it all off and start over. Um, you wanna, uh, don't, don't be too precious with your painting. Um, my art teacher always used to say, Harvey Schrader, um, I, 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 don't, I don't remember the exact verbiage, <laughs> but it was do every painting as though it's going to be the greatest painting of your life and yet be willing to destroy it. And that's a great attitude to have because you, you won't get so precious with it that you're afraid. And it's as soon as you start being afraid that you start um, 
making mistakes. I'm going to bring this all the way to the top so that I get a better feeling up here of how much atmosphere and space I have to work with above the pot. It's important as you're painting to enjoy every step and every stage and every process because um, each, each approach um, and each step of the process, you want to enjoy it because it's important. Each one is important. If, if you just try to hurry through one to get to the next, you may um, miss things or um, run roughshod over something that should have had a little bit more attention. If you don't have it correct in the beginning, you're just going to be tickling up um, a bad painting. One way to say it is putting frosting on a cardboard cake. <laughs> so be sure to be happy with every stage before you move on um, to the next development. And I don't mean, well, I guess if you're working in um, grisaille or you want to work in layers on your painting, that's you know that's your choice. I work in a in a method typically that's called a la prima, which means just one sitting. You you do it all in in one um, go around. <laughs> all right, so I don't want to spend too much time on the background. I'm just going to establish a little bit darker value here so that I get the sense of my concept, this movement going up this way. Now I don't have all of my values uh, represented here yet, so I'm going to uh, block in again, just real quick, the darker in here, just so that I know this is my strongest value. Especially when I'm blocking in a painting, I like to get the masses in, figure out where I'm going, and then I focus on my darkest values. Um, and then I will work on my lighter values after that because I've already got medium down when I tone the canvas. Okay. So at this point, I'm gonna get some of the lighter areas just featured a little in, in and around here. So I know that this orange here is going to have some very predominant whites and I don't I hope you can see that maybe I can if I put it like this maybe you can see it a little better that is white with a little bit of cadmium yellow See some of that same over here. And then as we come around, that orange picks up less light and it gets a little darker. I, I don't know that you'll be able to see all of that, but um, when I share this picture on Facebook when I'm done with this, um, you'll be able to see it a little better. And of course, it'll be reversed because uh, the live video always reverses things. And no, I'm not left-handed. <laughs> Although, sometimes I, I paint with my left hand. <laughs> Just to really confuse everybody. Okay, so spot on the pot. Let's go right there. It has a nice um, sort of meandering tail and I, I have a lot more to paint on this pot but 
it gives the whole thing a sense of form as well as down here on the on the pot I'm seeing a strong orange reflected in the the brass okay now um, just gonna come back and kind of mass in a little bit more for the grapes I've got um, my lizard permanent and some cadmium yellow cadmium yellow is I call it my sunlight it also is uh, what I use for transparency. So anywhere that light is affecting something, I, my cadmiums work great for that. Um, because I, it, it, they just seem to glow. Again, just massing, thinking about the grapes as a mass, a solid mass. And then it's very, it's no work at all to um, add a few uh, spaces in the middle of background or whatever. Gives them a nice sense of being connected. And this grape up front is quite a bit darker. So I'm using a little bit more alizarin and ultramarine blue as I work on some of these grapes that are in the shadow. Just right into what I've already got there, right over the top of that. There's a grape right here, right about here, that looks pretty dark. And another one over here. Gonna lighten up the surface of the table a little so that it has that impact right here. Now I'm gonna take a little bit of artistic license and um, brighten up the surface of the table just a little more. A little light, maybe some yellow ochre, but I want it to have that sense of it being the, the surface of the table. And I, so I use horizontal brush strokes to create that effect. Always being aware that as it goes back, it's going to get softer and darker and cooler. And same thing with painting landscapes. Everything up close to you is more. It's it's more contrast, more warmth, more vibrance, um, thicker paint, whatever, things that are further away are less. And so they get to be um, less paint, less um, contrast. And now that's just a little bit more intense on the surface of this table than what is over there. So I'm feeling a little better about that because that's all I wanted is just to lift the tone of the canvas a little more <clears throat> and uh, create that illusion. We'll go around those grapes just a little. Alrighty, now um, the orange. Let's get some really great transparency and that that illusion of light coming through there. One thing about working from nature, if you're if you had the still life set up before you and you were using natural light, which again is always best if you can do it, um, you are also uh, kind of constrained to um, the light's going to change on there. So you better grab it. 
and then I always recommend painting those temporal things first. All right, so, or if it's gonna decay. <laughs> All right, so let me focus on this. I've got cad red and cad yellow for this orange. One or two pieces of paint per transaction on the canvas. You don't, uh, you, if you keep going with what's on your brush, it can tend to get muddy. And, and people are always asking, how do I, my paints always end up looking muddy and I don't know what I'm doing wrong. And I said, well, um, how many brush strokes are you doing? You know, and I just watch for a while and you can always tell they pick up the paint and they do 47 brush strokes with what's on the brush. And I said, well, that's why your paint's getting money because um, lay down a piece of paint, go back and get more. And uh, you'll find that it'll start to take on a cleaner, more articulate, intentional presence. And that's what you want. I'm going to add just the smallest bit of white where the light is just filtering through that corner. I'm going to use a little bit of a lizard too in the depth of that wedge back in here. When I squint down at it, it gets darker and there's a subtle grayness to the, as the light can't really hit that part of the orange. All right, now, um, the, the peel of the orange as it comes down, that takes on like a darker gray. And I'm gonna paint that real quick. Just because it gives us a nice uh, contrast. So I'm, well, I squint down at it to try to establish exactly what color that is. I'm seeing a little bit of a warmth, some yellow oak or burnt sienna into my gray mixture. Let's try that on. Oh yeah, I like that. And I see it back here. And there's a little bit more of a white as it comes down and is getting some of the light from that orange membrane hitting into it. But that sudden opacity next to all that transparency is just a lovely contrast. And then I'll do the orange peel on the front. Now that is going to have a little different texture, a different feeling overall because it is, um, it's opaque, it's not transparent. So the shadow of the orange, I'm, I've just got a little bit of burnt sienna and blue into that. And a little bit of the brighter orange on the outside. And that did not get very bright because I think I had some of it um, on the brush. <laughs> and uh, at this point, because I know I'm gonna paint the background around this, I know that I can carve out around there to sort of refine that shape a little more. And I've got a little bit of that color here too. So I'll get that orange here soon. Right now I'm gonna get some of this background, the tabletop, to carve around this. And I don't mind 
that this orange that's right up in front has a little bit stronger edge because it is the focal area. And we're gonna let that guy be celebrated because it's like right there. And then one a little darker up here behind it, that will really set off that transparent glow. And it's a little darker shade behind it. And then over back here, just as it serves an anchor, I don't want to put too much dark in the thing, in the whole overall. And we've got some of that. This orange is casting a shadow on this orange, which is bumping into that one. Okay, so I like how that's, those two are working together. Always looking for those areas where things can connect. Look for passages where you can sort of unite objects rather than separate. That will give your painting a sense of um, unity. So I'm fine with those as my focal area right now, and uh, grab that. Now I'm going to work on this orange a little bit since I've got all these oranges right here, and uh, we'll get that going too. So again, um, a little bit of that cad red. I don't know if you can still see. Um, Rita, this will be on YouTube. And um, I will, uh, yeah, I'll just take all of this right down from Facebook and I'll put it right on YouTube. And I think I want to try to, um, when I go live on Fridays, I'm going to try to have two cameras set up, one for YouTube and one for Facebook. But thanks for joining. <laughs> so I'm just laying down these pieces of cadmium um, red with the cad yellow and I'm putting in a little yellow ochre as it starts to turn and go under the body of the orange. A little bit of dark under here, like dark orange, that's alizarin and blue. I'm trying to also be aware that this orange wedge has to appear to have come from that orange. So I don't want to make this one too small and like, where'd that one come from? It's like a giant. I'll just fix that there. Um, all right, so back at this. Just lay down pieces of paint. The nice thing about painting with small pieces of paint is that you're not, you don't, you're not committed to um, a, a big pile of paint. You've got to get it all over the place and you just have, they're like pieces of the puzzle and, and you get to sort of play with it. And does this fit here? And no, well then take your time and go back and, you know, fix it, put a little more piece down right there.
And even though I don't have the background completely done in this area yet, I want this roundness of this orange to be softer. Like that. <laughs> I hope everyone can see. You can kind of, okay. I keep checking back at the camera to make sure that we're all, it's all all right. Let's see. Um, now inside the orange up on this wedge, I'm just taking some of that um, blue and brown mixture that I have with a little white and some yellow ochre. And I'm squinting at that orange to get that exact color. Seeing a little bit more blue gray in it. Sorry. Little piece of paint, is that right? Let's try, maybe a little lighter. Um, lay it down. A little lighter. Oh, I think right along the edge where the cut part meets the lit part, it's a little darker in there. Always gauging, is that okay? Is that, you know, should I pull that back? Should I, again, the same old question, what if, what if I pulled this down? What if I darkened that? What if I, what if I added some alizarin, you know? <laughs> A little bit more yellow. In here. A little red. I want it to feel like an orange, um, rather than look kind of cut and dead. When I squint at it, I can see a lot of variety inside this wedge, but if you squint, you don't see quite as much of all of the subtle changes, which is very helpful because that can be overwhelming. There's so many paths you can go down for mixing and I always try to say to simplify your world as much as possible. Life is too complicated. <laughs> around here and give this side of the orange a little bit more definition. Small articulate pieces of paint. And surprisingly, for a round object as an orange, I'm seeing subtle little angles and I always try to dig out angles wherever I can find them, even on round objects and trees and wherever, because it gives it a sense of solid structure. Whatever it is you're painting, a person, anatomy, whatever, the, the world is full of sharper and subtle angles that just have a nicer sense of form. While I have this darker shadowy orange that I'm working with here, I'm going to um, work on just some of this back in here, this little orange peel. Oh, that's darker. If I turn this off, is there, is that, does that help? I think I'm going to leave that off if that helps to see the paint. I'm seeing kind of a glare on the canvas. Anybody have any thoughts about that? <laughs> If I need it back on, I'll turn it on. A little bit more blue. I'm gonna make just a bigger pile of gray here because I do use that gray a lot. And back here in the, um, uh, <laughs> uh, back here in this little orange peel, there's some gray that's just a nice subtle gray inside the peel. A little bit more light, just a little. Maybe that's too much. And, that, and that's another reason I don't pre-mix all my colors on my palette before starting a painting, because um, 
First of all, you don't know what you're gonna need and how much of it. And by pre-mixing it, you presuppose that all of your decisions at that point are accurate. And, and then you're committed to using them, um, which I, I prefer the more organic method of what I need, I mix. Sometimes when I'm doing plein air and I see a passage of a bunch of greens, I might mix up in that process of the painting a few piles of greens just so I can quickly grab into them, but I wouldn't just mix them up ahead of time. And I do want this a little darker back here so that I can lose this edge. Painting your background at the same time as you're painting your objects is very important because you have to paint into um, the background, you know, to lose your edges and things and um, make things a little softer. And so I always try to do that at the same time. And it's never more important than when you're doing a portrait because you have to lose some of those edges in portraiture to, to create bone structure and capture a likeness. And every part has to matter to you. It has to, you have to care. Because um, as soon as you stop caring, like if you get tired or you're getting distracted or whatever, it's time to stop. Just stop for the, the moment, for the day, whatever. But um, do not keep going if you're getting fatigued or you find, I, I hate this, I don't care about it anymore. <laughs> this is a dumb painting, why am I fighting with it? So that's always best. You're just gonna aggravate yourself more. And there's nothing wrong with feeling that way. I think everybody's felt that way. Um, just coming back up in here, kind of toying around with the pot a little more. This side of the pot is very dark, and yeah, I, I will be getting a little bigger brush. It's kind of small. All right, now I want to, before I put this teeny brush away, I wanna just really hit up this impact of the orange right here. I feel that that is, is just a little dull. And your oil paints will always dry darker the next day. So your first session, if you're gonna paint um, in more than one session, it has to be really rich and vibrant because it's gonna dry darker. So I'm just taking a nice, Thick chunk of paint. I'm laying that down very carefully, right where it's getting that impact of the light hitting it, right there. So I think that I, it's still kind of grayish on what you're seeing here on the camera. I'm not sure why it's so gray, but when I share this, you'll see it a little bit better. Okay, so now um, getting the lit side of the orange that's cut. I'll take some more cadmium red and some of the cad yellow and some white and come up in here. Again, squinting down at it. Down here where the light's really hitting it, it's very yellow. And every now and then I twirl my brush right off onto the canvas or the palette because it can get built up around the fuel. And so I, I just wipe that off every now and then. Instead of wiping it, all of that good paint off on my paper towel, I just wipe it right on the can the palette and then I can use it if it's okay. So 
So now I'm taking just a, a nice buttery white and yellow to get the the member the pith <laughs> of the orange. Let's get that a little bit. I just want it to be a little more different than the actual orange. And up here toward the top of it, it's very white. The smallest touch of yellow in it. Now, um, where the light is hitting the wet part of this orange, I'm going to put um, just a little highlight on it to indicate those shines. And I like to use um, sort of a blue and white for that because if I squint down at those uh, highlights on the orange, it, it sort of has that appearance of being sort of a, a light, very light blue. So this brush is almost dry. It's very like a light blue on there. And I'm just going to sort of scumble and dance that over the edge to indicate those little um, cellular things in the orange. You probably can't see it on here but I will show you <laughs> when I share it. So a few more little zingers and that's okay. Be a little bit right in here. Okay, so now, um, while I've got it, just a few little uh, back in here. I just want to suggest a little bit of light coming through and <clears throat> hitting this back orange. Just for interest. Almost one of those things that's sort of in the shadows that you look at later. Oh, that's cool. That's way back there. I'm going to wipe that off and really soften the edges. The eye is always drawn to the area of the greatest contrast. And that can also mean um, edges too. So you know, like I said, everything up front has more sharper edges and um, more uh, thicker paint, greater contrast. But if you put that in the background, or anywhere that you don't want the eye to look, then they're going to look there. <laughs> so be careful where you're drawing the eye at all times. Just keep it really quiet. Carve that in, and that thing is done. Okay, now um, what I'm going to do at this point is go through and paint the copper pot. Clean this off. That's not copper. Um, <laughs> brass. Gosh. So squinting at it. I'm squinting down. I close one eye. This is what I'm doing. So I, I close this eye and then I squint with the other eye and that helps really reduce it to simplified values and colors. So I've got my dark pretty much established in there. So I'm going to just take right into this yellow ochre mixture that I had here, some burnt sienna. Maybe I'll tone it down with a little bit of gray. And I had that burnt sienna ultramarine blue mixture right here. I'll take some of that. 
Let's tone it down. By toning it down, I mean make it less vibrant. Less, um, take the chrome out, the chroma. Um, that, that brings down the, the energy of the color <laughs> down to manageable levels. So this is that burnt sienna yellow ochre mixture on the top where the light isn't hitting it and it shows some rounded form. And back here, it pretty much just got lost to the background. I really like that feeling of losing that. more. I took some yellow ochre and some cadmium red. Now where I paint thinner like this, I don't I don't mind if you do. I mean for me personally I'll I'll do a few passes of brushwork instead of doing just the one stroke and then one or two strokes. Because when you're painting um, thinner, you're kind of moving some paint around a little bit more. Whereas when you're painting thicker, you're applying the thicker passages of, of paint onto it. So make more than a couple strokes per application. Yellow ochre. A little cadmium yellow is, as the pot starts to turn and come into light a little bit more. I really like how the movement of it comes down around um, as it as it turns then and comes under that beautiful sense of cascading light. I'm gonna have some over here too. Again, where that's turning and going under. I think this is softer and muted, but it as it starts to go up towards the highlight on that shiny side right here, it's going to build with this beautiful intensity, and I'll use thicker paint for that as well. There's a leaf. So a little more cadmium yellow, yellow ochre. some of that up here too. As it starts to sort of navigate toward the highlight, I do add a little bit more white to it. And um, chrome as well. The, you pick up the chrome again, bring in some more of the cadmiums. Um, as it goes into shadow, I'm going to incorporate a little more gray into um, some of that dusting where the metal has a nice sense of turning.
and a little bit of the white and the blue right here in front I'm seeing a lot of that gray just gently dusting over the metal A lot of times people feel that um, the brighter and richer and more intense they paint something, the more it'll stand out. And, but unfortunately what happens is a whole sea of bright colors doesn't make a bright painting. Right? It just makes a very colorful painting. Um, but if you select passages to be bright and then let others play second fiddle to that, it, it will have a stronger impact and, um, and make more sense. You'll, it'll, the feeling you're trying to evoke will be more obvious. So again here, I'm thinking about the edges of the pot and as they slip into the background to show form and the roundness of the pot. A little bit more muted. That is that bluish whitish gray that comes around. And sometimes I lay a solid thick piece of paint and then other times I just scumble over it. I think what I would like to do is bring you in a little bit closer so you can kind of see what I'm doing for brushwork. So forgive the movement here. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, so now I definitely will not be able to see your comments, but I think it might be more helpful to be able to see it up close. Okay. Nope, that makes it a glare for me. All right, I think you're okay that way. And uh, I'll just tell you what I'm mixing. If, if there's any questions, I'll try to see your comments. Um, so a little white, little blue. Grab a little bit of sienna to create, to tone it down and make a gray. And I'm just gently, you can see I'm, I'm just sort of using the edge of my brush, just scumbling it in place where I see sort of that grayish shimmer on the pot. right up in front here. And I also see a dusting right here. And again, that's just the lightest whisper on the pot like that. And the smallest bit back here that slips into shadow but I have um, the need for a little bit more of the form under this lip so the the actual pot here is defining the form of that and then on this side the background is defining the form of the lip of the pot. I'll soften that a little. Get a linseed oil in here and clean this up some. Oh, 
all of the the noise in the background of all of this can distract from my overall concept. So every now and then I'll just stop what I'm doing and sort of take a mental break and come back and clean up my background. Just a little. All of that vibrancy is um, in a way sort of killing the effect that I'm trying to get in the quiet of the painting. Keeping that concept my objective. darker all the way down in the pot. This has such a lovely form. Okay, see by lightening that, it, it pops it out from the background this way. And then again, as I come on this side and darken it, again, it helps really to define the shape of the pot. Getting a bigger brush. I don't mind if it's thin, I just don't want it distracting. And I know there's a big glare on it. I don't know if I do the brush strokes this way, you can see a little better. But one thing I want the background to always do is to be supportive of the foreground, which means if it's drawing my attention, then it's not doing its function. If I'm looking at it, if I'm cognizant and aware of it, um, then it's, it's pulling my attention back there and I don't want it to do that. So the background always should be allowing you the freedom to stay in the foreground. It's a little too bright. I'm just going to tone that down with some yellow ochre. Yellow ochre is such a wonderful color for neutralizing um, chrome. Whatever your chrome situation is, it is so great at just toning it down, making it less screaming at you. <laughs> it basically does shh. <laughs> Calm down. I'm just gonna lay down the pieces of the the most vibrant not the brightest highlight yet I mean I've done that just to indicate the form but right here I want to just start suggesting that this is the most bulbous part of the pot right in this area
And I, I mean, if I have more time and I wanted to take more time to really get that um, hammered effect of this metal, that would be fun to play with. And I'm not gonna take a lot of time on that um, just for the sake of this demo. Also, I wanted to let you know, all of, all of the demos that I'm gonna be doing here on Facebook, I'm gonna be offering at reduced prices for the purpose of these as an educational purpose. Um, so they're going to be offered on a first come first serve basis for people as they're watching. Um, so just so you know, uh, message me I, with any of my lessons. They're probably not going to end up on my website. So uh, let me know if the one that I'm working on isn't already claimed and we can discuss that. But they're going to be reasonably priced. No, most of the time, um, if somebody takes a workshop, I offer workshop prices on my demos so um I, I I like to do that with some of these as well because I think that anytime you can enhance your education by owning the original <clears throat> that was demoed you tend to remember the the lesson a little better that just go off. I'm gonna let that side just go off. Okay. Now I want to get the highlight in there. So I'll just get a cleaner brush for that because I don't want to, this one's all contaminated. That is very much the white and cad yellow. And it's sort of a blob and a squiggle. <laughs> Pretty sure that's the technical term for that. And we have that again up here. Because it's hammered, it's not perfect. I've got a few squiggles here and there. All right, one last little highlight on the rim of this that I think it needs. Clean that up. All right, now uh, to get some of these reflections in the pot from the orange right down in here in front, taking a little bit of the cadmium red into the yellow. It's very subdued in the pot, but it's, it's definitely present. So I wanna observe very carefully where those are. I squint down at it to see, and their edges are very muddied into the pot because they're not very articulate. They're just a reflected light, reflected image. I'm coming up on this Right there, that peel. Yeah. And then, of course, inside this orange is a different color in the pot. Yellow ochre. We got a little bit of light. It's a little lighter right here. And right in there. Okay. 
Okay, so now um, I'm gonna just pull out a little bit more of the darker that was around here that I had but ended up painting over it because I had it in the wrong spot. So laying my brush on the side like this, I'm just scumbling in some small pieces of paint to indicate a little bit darker value here. And some of those are in behind this orange. Oops. Okay, so now I'm going to clean this off and just sort of soften. This effect. Let me come around under this orange. Oops, lighter. I mean darker. And then way back here it gets really dark. And I want to pull out some more of the intensity of this orange right up in front because it needs to stand out. Here. All right, now going to work on the grapes and this the shadow of the pot um, created by the grapes and that's not a very dense heavy shadow so I'm using a little bit more alizarin into it and I just don't want it to be really black it would feel too heavy because the grapes are transparent and they are allowing light to shine through so shadows created by grapes um, they just need to have a sense of air to them. So I'll let this shadow just sort of bleed down there. And this little board it's sitting on. There we go. Just a little, little information on it. Okay. Now, the key to painting grapes is to, um, I'm going to back this up a little bit, is again to think about it in a mass, as a mass. So we'll angle it like that. I hope you can kind of see, there we go, kind of see both. So as I squint down at that mass of grapes, and again, my angle is different than what you can see it, I'm looking for uh, the, the shape of the darks. I think that the overall shape is fine, but I wanna get the, where it tucks in first, my darker values first. So that's, I'm just using a little bit of the alizarin and um, some of the ultramarine blue, a little sienna. Not much. I don't want it to be super heavy. And I'm seeing kind of right in the middle here as I squint down, just a passage of this darker passage here that just connects. And I'm looking at the shape of that darker passage. 
Again, not worried about seeing individual grapes. My concern for this is that I see the mass, the whole, see it all as a whole. Okay, now, um, let's see, does that represent the, I think that that pretty well represents that dark shape inside that mass of grapes. Now I want to define the passages where there, it's lighter and more of the cadmium yellow glowing through it. Some of that cad red. This grape right up on top is just saying happy to be alive. Ooh, look at me. It might be a little bit too intense, so I'll wipe my brush off and just go whoop. A little bit. We're gonna let that just sort of sit there. Where else do I see it down here? Cadmium, red and yellow. <laughs> um. All right, so a little bit more of the cadmium red and some of the alizarin. Let's take some of that. And this is going to be sort of blocking in some of wherever these other lighter grapes are. And this is, I'm, I'm looking at these grapes sort of in the way I paint water. What is the color that I see underneath first? And that's what I did with that alizarin scumble over the whole mass. And then um, how do I build up from there, from that lower layer, the illusion of layers of light and color. And then at the very end, I'm gonna dust the dust on the grapes and put a shine on them. But that's not till I'm done with the building up those layers underneath it. Oops. And this one in the front is getting a nice little hit of lighter color. And then I think that some of these have a little bit more alizarin, so I'm just taking a thin layer of alizarin and gonna layer this on in some passages. Maybe alizarin and cadmium red, just those two. More of the alizarin than the red. I'm just putting in, kind of redefining these one grapes that were a little darker, the, the deeper purple ones. Now dust, I'll put the dusting on those that it'll make them look a little bit more light once that dust is on.
here. Again, I'm kind of just starting to clean up the shape on some of these as well with that alizarin and ultramarine blue. Now, time to put on some of that dust. I think we'll use the smaller brush. White and a little bit of blue. You can do a little bit of sienna too. And it's just a thin, gentle scumble. In fact, as I work on this, I'm gonna pull you in a little closer. Hmm. Hope that that's not too hard to see. And some of these have more dust than others. And the dust is kind of it's just sort of some squiggles and um, some of the dust is sort of pinkish in tone too. And this one is very light over here. I'm just softening that around. What you want to do when you're painting a, a, a a pile of grapes like this is to select some of these grapes to be the celebrity <laughs> which ones are gonna get the most attention you don't it's not necessary to paint them all with the same amount of detail in fact don't <laughs> because it doesn't it doesn't help their cause if they're all painted equally important again remember you're always uh, your focus is always to lead the eye and tell us what you wanted us to do. Are we to look here? We did not look here. Where are you directing traffic here? And um, and that's that's what your job is as an artist is to you cannot you kind of control this little world here and call the shots. I mean, essentially, that's what composition is. That's a nice way to to sort of boil down what composition means. Telling the viewer what to do, where to go, how to get there, and how long to stay. So they're kind of starting to take on that dusty grape look. Feeling better about all of that. A little more blue and white down on my palette. I know it's kind of hard to see or impossible to see. <laughs>
I do like how this grape in front just sort of leads in. So, but I have to shape it a little better. Now I mentioned um, the shadows created by grapes and that they're transparent. So the shadows themselves need to have a little bit of transparency. So I'm going to take and put a little bit of that cadmium into the shadow there. Cad red, cad light, it doesn't, it doesn't matter just as long as it's not um, really distracting and make a big scene. Cleaning these up. All right, and then I'm going to take a little bit more of that tabletop background color and help use it to carve around some of these grapes. I think that's kind of important to give them a little bit better shape. Okay, and then they're sitting on a little bit of the cutting board, so I'll just get some of that in place. And it's it's pretty neutral back here because it's already slipping into shadow, but I'm still going to use it to help define the shape of these grapes here, just a little. Okay, getting closer. All right, um, now I'm just going to add some highlights to the grapes. Um, I'll get the stem. Stem's pretty much, I just painted around it. So I'm going to just sort of suggest that the light is hitting it stronger right there. Clean that up. And there was a little shadow cast on the pot, so we'll just go like that. Soften some of these shadows. As I don't want them looking cut out. And Slip a little alizarin in those shadows too. All right, and then some highlights on these grapes. Now, this is where it can get um, fuzzy because you could look at the grapes and you see shines on all of them. So I just want to select the ones that are going to work for me. So I like this one here, and I like this one over here. This one. Thinking about it in terms of music, like little notes, music notes, as they move up. Like that. Get one up here. And I think just one more back here. 
Okay, now I'm just gonna take a little bit of kind of a greenish ochre to suggest some of the stems. Now I'm just going to look around and see if there's anything else that needs a little bit of finesse and see what needs to, I mean, obviously I would take more time, but I want to wrap this up. All right, <laughs> well, I think that that went a little bit longer than my um, 20 minute allotment. <laughs> Actually, I think that we went about two hours. So um, thank you everybody who held on. And um, if you're watching on YouTube, thanks so much for watching. Um, be sure to like and subscribe if you enjoyed it. And everybody on Facebook who's watching right now, um, thank you. And I will hopefully see you next Friday. And I would like to do these a lot more often um, as, as it works out. and as it works in my schedule. And I will make announcements um, during the week about uh, going live on that Friday. So if you're watching on YouTube, um, follow me on Facebook and you'll get those announcements. And I will also try to make posts on YouTube as well. I know you can make little posts about when I'll be live. I know that they like to catch on to when I'm doing that as well. And again, um, if you left questions, I will get to those when I'm done. And um, yeah, thanks so much, everybody, and I hope that this was helpful, and I will see you next time. All right, bye-bye.